Then I was fertilized and became wise. I truly grew and thrived. From a word to a word, I was led to a word. From a deed to a deed, I was led to a deed. The children of Europe, raised in her fire and fury, have a history unequaled. Nowhere has witnessed such depths of tragedy or heights of glory. Mimas Brunner is dedicated to celebrating both Europe and her children, to stir the sacred waters that animate, and to bring the ancient ways back to the forefront of the European mind. Through our work, we wish to rekindle those ancient embers of the European fire, and to once again hold our ancestors and their deeds in the reverence they deserve. To know your ancestors is to know yourself. One second, that should be better. Okay, I forgot to plug my mic in. So that's a great start we've got off to today. Um, but good evening, ladies and gentlemen, anyway. Uh, I hope the audio is coming through okay now. Uh, if anybody in the chat could just give me uh, a little nod that it's okay. <laughs> no, it's all good. Anyway, I'd like to apologize first and foremost. Uh, for not doing the stream last night, uh, tonight we're going to be using some, uh, trying to utilize our technology a little bit better. So we're going to be um, doing a few slides, which uh, took a little bit longer than I first expected. Uh, getting used to, uh, I, didn't, I didn't quite anticipate how long it would take me to get the slides together. So... There was a bit of a delay last night, and there was it was going to be no good. I was going to be streaming at three o'clock if I'd done it my time, that is, if I'd have carried on with that. So we decided to delay it till tonight, and I know tonight is not the, the best night for it, especially given the time period that we're doing this. It's a bit of an in-between for everybody. Um, so I do apologize for that, uh, and we'll try and get it back on track for next week. And um, we need to try and get them a little bit earlier too, to be honest, but we're working on that. But um, before I get into the show a little bit, I'd like to say that we'll probably be leaving this video up um, on YouTube and Facebook. We normally take them down, but this one should be okay and should be safe from any... Uh, attacks so it's good to so we should be leaving it up and we'll see how that goes so but for people that don't know most of our uh, all of our live streams are archived at our Libri channel I'm sure somebody I'm sure risk and uh, link it or how and also on our bit shoot uh, the bit shoot is a week later because we want to try and encourage people over to Libri because we believe that that's going to be a, a big place soon but uh, we'll see about that uh, I can see a lot of good people in here tonight. Um, we've got racial consciousness. I even think I saw Way of the World, but I'm not sure if it was him. If it is him, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Phoenix Fire. I done see there's I mean, a lot of people. It's uh, great to see you and great to have everybody here, by the way. Uh, these live streams wouldn't be much of much use if nobody was listening. I'd also like to make a quick apology to Mother Hen and Verbo Tempestus. I'm not sure if they're over there on DLive, but uh, I did promise to go to their stream and I completely forgot about it. And I do apologize for that. So I'll try and check that out this week if they're streaming. And uh, Way of the World says it is him. Well, that's great to see it. Have you here, mate? Uh, so thanks for joining us. Now, is there anything else I need to cover before I get into the, the main show tonight? Like I say, it's going to be a slideshow. 
well, there's going to be some slides at least, um, to try and utilize the visual capabilities of this rather than just staring at my face for the whole thing, uh, which sometimes seems a bit pointless. I understand that he engages more on a live stream to have somebody's face there. So, But at the same time, it's a bit... Uh, a bit silly. My face will be there in case you in case you've got some kind of perversion and miss it. But um, but there will be uh, slides tonight. Now tonight's show it's going to be about Thor's hammer or axe. But uh, and um, the history of it and the meaning. We're going to go right back and we're going to look at it from a historical perspective. We're going to. Um, try and see what we can piece together from it. Now, I'd like to do a little disclaimer first. Uh, heathenism is a very, unlike Christianity or the Abrahamic faces, can be very individual, very personal, and people have their own opinions and people interact with the gods and goddesses in their own ways. Um, so the disclaimer is that this is just part of my research. I hope that it can add to yours and add to your understanding. But it is not the whole understanding of the false hammer. Um, it is not by any means the absolute truth. If you disagree with something, that's absolutely fine. We're all on our journeys here in heathenism. And Mimmers Bunner was event initially started as showing my, um, showing my research, my journey into heathenism. Now, there's lots of things I know, but I found that writing about them, doing live streams about them, in made me engage in the subject matter more, made me look at the gods and goddesses more, uh, the symbols as well. So I hope if at the very least what we get tonight is that it intrigues you and that you look yourself, find your own personal connections with the gods and goddesses. Now some people may talk down on personal connections, but you have to connect uh, if you want to practice heathenism. It's no heathenism. It's no good just reading others, listening to others. Although that can be beneficial and it can help you on your way, you need to search, you need to seek yourself. Um, but like I say, this is not the be-all and end-all of the Force Hammer. There'll be many esoteric meanings hidden in there and I've only got so much time tonight and to put a show together where I can at least show my thinking. Uh, it's one thing having an idea, but uh, when you've got to present it, you need to have a lot of things to present it with. But we will be going back right pretty far back. We're going to be going back to the Mesolithic briefly and then into the Neolithic where it takes on more importance. And then we'll be bringing it forward. We'll be going on a few tangents too. Um, some interesting tangents that I'm not quite sure what to make of, but there's certainly something there and they should be interesting. Now, of course, one of the reasons I've been meaning to do this for a bit and I will put up some uh, articles too on this subject because obviously I create uh, uh, hammers pendants. Um, in fact, due to this, I carved a, a different pendant whilst I was doing the research because I was so taken with some of the imagery and I'll explain that when I see it. And when I carve or create or just as when I want to present anything, any kind of idea, um, I like to know as much as I can about it. I don't create these things just as a novelty item. Uh, or just create them for some kind of, just a quick way to make money or anything like that. I make them by hand and I want to understand what I'm making. Or the, pro the process, whether it, the practical process and the spiritual process to whatever I do. Um, especially when it's something as important and as significant as the Force Hammer within the heathen community. Um, but like I say, the disclaimer here is just that what I'm going to present is just my research. And I encourage everybody to do their own and look in. And maybe we can add to yours, who knows. Now, uh, just a point on that because, and the reason I had to put that disclaimer in is because um, we, have, we live in a world where everybody knows everything. You've probably seen them on Facebook, seen them on YouTube, Twitter, etc., where everybody wants to tell you what to think, uh, tell you how to think, especially in the heathen communities, but in all, all areas. Um, knowing is a is a very important thing to know something, but knowing also causes ignorance, because when you know something, you don't seek anymore. 
And there can be no better age to demonstrate this than the age that we live in today. Everybody seems to know everything, yet we live in an age of complete ignorance. Um, the de death of the seeker. So it is important when we approach anything that we approach it with humility. We approach it that we don't know and that we seek. Then we can make genuine connections with the gods, goddesses and any information that comes our way. Um, we can take it all in and observe it all without making, without dismissing it offhand. Um, and this allows us to grow. We must entertain these ideas regardless of them and process them themselves so we get a better understanding. This will help you in any argument or debate that you have when you understand your subject matter. When you have put the effort into it and also have the humility to know that there is probably much beyond your grasp. But like I say, uh, this is my information, my, some of my research, and only some of it. So there's a lot to this symbol. And I'm sure lots of people will add some great comments in the, uh, in the chat room, so please keep an eye on those if you can. Now, before I get into the main show, of course, it was in bulk recently, on the weekend. I did want to do a little show on that, but uh, although I did a little ceremony myself, Honouring Brigade. As I say, I'm not strictly a Norse pagan. I'm a, I'm a heathen of the North, uh, is how I like to put it. And that's all eras. And as you'll see tonight, we're going to go through some of those eras. When I present anything, as I said, I like to um, reevaluate. And I like to reevaluate what I know all the time. Because um, as I grow, as I learn more, when I look back at things I thought I already knew, suddenly new things pop out at me, new ideas. So before I wanted, before presented anything on Inbulk, I wanted to uh, relook at it. And I just didn't have time with what's been going on. So maybe next year for that one. Uh, but it also was a Fauri blot, or I think it's called, but uh, it's an Icelandic, but Fors blot. Recently too, midwinter blot. Uh, this will be a little bit in tandem with that. We'll be looking at some of those things. But anyway, to today's, tonight's show, the Thor's Hammer, probably the most enigmatic symbol and prolific symbol of modern heathenism, especially Norse heathenism, but heathenism in general. Um, I don't personally know a heathen that probably doesn't have one. Um, that's how important they are. Um, and why has this come about? Hopefully we're going to um, find some of that out tonight. And like I said at the start, we're going to go really far back and then bring it forward and go on a few little interesting tangents. Um, so anyway, without further ado, I'll try and get to the slides. Now, bear with me. I hope it all works well. They're, they're not the best slides in the world, but... Uh, it's a lot more effort than I thought, as I said, so let's see if this works. I might have to reposition myself a little bit. <clears throat> okay. I'll just take a drink before we get into it. I'm going to have to move something so I can see the slide properly. All right, well, here is the... As we know, with. um the hammer or the axe, these are tools. Oh, hold on one second. We appear to have a bit of a problem. Uh, okay, that seems correct. Sorry, our backdrop just dropped out there. I'm not sure why. I do apologize for that. Um, so back on track. The axe hammer, they're tools and they've been around since the Mesolithic. Um, some of these here, these are Neolithic tools that I'm just showing you here, polished tools. The top one there is a very early polished hammer from Ireland. There's a flint uh, axe. Uh, I'm not sure why the backdrop keeps dropping out here. Is that noticeable to you guys that the uh, blue background is dropping out? This is a little bit frustrating. Oh, I think I know why it might be. One second. Uh, 
Okay, that was an error on my part. I do apologise. I hadn't looped it. There you go. Technology, huh? We'll be getting into technology, actually, and how it relates to the Force Hammer, but... But uh, now that's cleared up. As I say, that's a very early polished axe from Ireland at the top there, and uh, that's... There's a, a couple of uh, flint axes there, too. And another polished axe on the side. They're mostly from the UK, Stonehenge, etc., and around, that were around those areas. But I just wanted to introduce the hammer and the axe, uh, because the hammer and the axe is something we're going to get into as we go on to this, because there is some debate. Obviously, we have the axe of Perun. Um, in Greek mythology too, uh, Zeus is often depicted with an axe, uh, a labyrinth, which we're going to have a look at. And also sometimes a hammer. That's also uh, true of other Greek uh, deities that carry such a tool. So the hammer and axe is uh, somewhat of a contention, but it doesn't have to be. And we're going to look at why that may have changed and what's going on with that. <clears throat> now, of course, the axe became a very prominent tool, especially the axe, in the Neolithic as we got the renewal of farming. But we're going to get into that a little bit. But before then, I just want to uh, look at the Mesolithic and some interesting antler axes. Now, these were found in burials, some of these. Uh, we're not, I'm not sure if any of these exactly were. Those ones, were, there was one underwater there from Sweden. The two on the left are from uh, Sweden and Denmark, I believe. On the right there, we have Starkar. Um, Starkar is a Mesolithic um, site in the UK. Um, and we also find antler axes. Now I've put in the uh, horned antler adornments found at Starkar. Um, because that horned aspect might come into this a little bit. It's like I say, it's one of the tangents that I'm going to show that I don't fully understand myself. But it's definitely something to be interested in. Those... Uh, Antler headdresses, though, are amazing. And I have any chance to post a picture of those is always a good one. Like I say, this is Mesolithic. This is pre-farming, very early Europe. And they're absolutely stunning. Um, and some of these axes are stunning that we're going to look into. Um, on the side, that is a, what we call Urtabal. I've pronounced that terribly, and I apologise to all my uh, Danish and Swedish and uh, Norwegian friends there. To a culture which is a, a, a late Mesolithic culture. Well, they're still hunter gatherers. It's Mesolithic North, Northern uh, Scandinavia. Like I said, these were featured in burials, and that obviously gives them some prominence. Um, once you start seeing things in burials, it obviously has some kind of spiritual meaning, spiritual connection. Although, given that this is the Mesolithic, we can't. The evidence is thin. We don't have much of anything to go on. So anything here is speculation. This is true, of course, also of the Neolithic. Um, and a lot of the North, actually, we have a lot of speculation going straight through because we don't have writing or we don't have people writing about them. So here we're going to, we're just going to move on, but I just wanted to show that, that the burial of these, the, the usage of burials with axes has been going on for a very long time. Of course, unlike the Neolithic, um, the axe wouldn't have had so much prominence uh, because clearing woods wouldn't have been so important, but clearings would have been important to them. Man starts to alter his uh, environment. He starts to, like I say, although he was dwelling mostly in forests and around forests and around river waterways, um, he would have been managing his area. Um, People often say like uh, people often say things about uh, forests and forest management. Well, in England, for example, forests have never not been managed. Uh, whilst humans have been here, they've been uh, a great resource, and managing that resource well um, helps you continue. Uh, your folk continue. Uh, pillaging that resource means you're not going to last very long unless you go and conquer new lands. Or find new ways. There was a study I read, and I forgot to put this in my notes about um, how they uh, the Mesolithic had 
were only hunting X amount of red deer to ma maintain population numbers. So they were very aware of keeping their environment and balance with that environment. And the axe was a tool of their ability to uh, change that environment. And so even at the MSLF, we can start to get a, a very, very potent symbol turning up of man's power in nature. Um, but now to the next slide. Now we're looking at the ancient North and Scandinavia, where the, obviously the uh, axe is prominent. So we're going to look at Funnel Beaker culture. It's from about 4,300 BC to about 2,800 BC. Now there is a crossover here with a very interesting culture uh, called Pitted Ware that starts, I'm going to have to check that one, 3,200 BC and ends about 2,300 BC. Now, the interesting thing about this culture is, although farming has been introduced into the north, um, this culture reverts back to a Mesolithic uh, lifestyle, hunter-gatherer. Um, kind of makes sense in, in the very northern regions um, of Scandinavia, in Scandinavia particularly, because of its mountainous regions, forest regions. It would make sense that farming would not be for everybody. But it is interesting that that happens. So there is a crossover. I'm going to focus mostly on Funnel Beaker culture, although these axe heads do show themselves in both uh, burials and very overlapping, actually, in many ways, and not just in date, in culture, etc. Apart from farming, if some communities are farming, it seems, and some communities are hunter gathering. Now, I just want to make a brief mention here of classifications. I'm using the term funnel beaker uh, because that's what people call it. But as I said earlier, it's best to not assume too much and look at everything on its own. A lot of these classifications, especially as they become more broader and wider swept, there are a lot of individual differences between each groups and tribal groups and areas. These classifications are just general and loose terms to give us um, a very it's kind of like grouping of anything. It just puts it in one area so we can just uh, kind of shove it over to one side. But it's important that when we look at things, we don't just say this is funnel beaker culture, this is corded ware culture, and, and spend no more time believing we already know about corded ware culture or funnel beaker culture. Um, now, this is not a show about those cultures, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but uh, that's just a little thing. We should look at everything in its own right. Every group, every site, in fact, every archaeological site, every territory. That's how we gain knowledge, not by assuming we know it all. Now, obviously, as I said before, this is a Neolithic culture, Funnel Beaker. Um, and axes become very important. And as we can see by this slide here, some of these axes here are absolutely exquisite. And these are polished stone. Now... I was so inspired that I uh, carved a little one that I'm going to probably cast. Uh, it just needs a little bit of finishing off, but I carved a small one there um, by, the, by these forms. Now, I carved out of wax. Now, uh, wax is a very easy material to carve in, and that's why I do it. But um, these here are, are carved out of stone. The effort time to get those curves. And not whittle away, as it were. I mean, I whittled that. I, I didn't, the one I did, I just got a piece of wax and looked at a picture and whittled away at it. And the problem with whittling away is that you can get very fast, you can start losing your material. So the effort put into those in a Neolithic culture would be almost unimaginable to any craft that we do today. So we can see a rise here in the prominence of this tool. This tool has been elevated from simply a work tool to something, um, something much more profound. Like I said, I, I couldn't imagine how long it would take to carve one of those. But they're absolutely stunning, like I say. They're also found in burials again. Um, this is something that we see. So we, we, we're seeing this, this, the tool turn into a spiritual object for certain now. Um, not just in burials, but we're seeing these. I can only assume that these were not just uh, burial axes, but ceremonial. 
Then we're going to be used in some kinds of ceremonial. But like I said, this is Neolithic. We have not much to go on. We have to assume a lot. It's a lot of speculation. But as we move forward, these things are important to understand because then we can take what we learn forward and put it, play it backwards a little bit. And as I said, because of the Neolithic culture, there's going to be a lot of clearing of uh, forests to grow crops. You need, you need uh, pasture uh, for, your, for your cattle and you need areas to grow for your, your grains. So it's clear that the uh, axe became a very important symbol of man and his relationship with nature. Uh, the axe was his power with, to control his area. Uh, so it is no wonder that these uh, symbols became uh, exceptionally powerful. Uh, and so much time and effort was taken to carve such beautiful axes. And I've left this slide up a little bit longer than I probably should have because I just want people to just see how stunning these are. I mean, they since a child I've drawn axes. I've always been interested in in the shape, and and they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, maybe it's some ancestral connection there. Maybe one of my great great ancestors far 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 down the line carved one of these, and it's uh, stuck in my uh, blood for that long. Who knows, huh? But uh, they are absolutely stunning. Um, now we're just going to move to the next slide. And this is an interesting one. This is again from around the Fonobika culture in the north. These are not axe heads. They're pendants. So again, we see the movement of this symbol to something much more than a tool. Uh, this is starting to show signs of devotion. Uh, we're starting to show signs that they're carrying an axe as a as a symbol of something um, spiritual, and it is a spiritual uh, endeavor. Uh, having the axe gave you such control over your environment. Um, so we can start to see the symbol forming as a, a spiritual talisman. Uh, we don't have mention of gods here or goddesses at the moment because obviously we're still too far back in time to, to have any records of such things. But it is clear that uh, a goddess, a god or a goddess, although there is animals and is, well, people are worshipping uh, not necessarily figures at this time. We're not getting too many figures. They come a little bit later in the north, uh, although they are start, so human figures anthropomorphic gods and goddesses but it doesn't matter um there's certainly some spiritual element here now to the next slide now this is a little tangent i'm going to go on here this is the minoan labrys now the labrys came at the neo-palatial uh, period of minoan culture or where, that's where it reaches its prominence which, prominence which is about 1700 bc some people I did when I was doing research this read some uh, people making big connections between those double-headed axes, because these are double-headed axes, something quite unique at this time, um, and unique in all of the times, actually, the double-headed axe. So some people have obviously made connections with the Labris from the Minoan cultures and, to a lesser extent, the Mycenaean cultures. Now... The thing to note here is it's much later. We're talking there, we're talking around 3000 BC. Here we're talking 1700 BC. Now, I haven't had enough time to look right into the very early aspects of the Minoan uh, Labris. And I'm sure it was around a lot earlier than that in, in many forms. Um, so there could be some connection uh, for sure. But the, the important thing to understand about the Labris that makes it differ well, I say differ, but from, say, the false hammer later, is that this was a tool of the goddess, although Zeus later does wield the labris, as I said earlier, and Maldat is due. But with the Minoan culture, it was definitely a mother goddess symbol. Um, like I say, make of that what you will. I just thought it was interesting. Those are pendants, by the way. Uh, these weren't tools. Uh, the double axe head like that is not a great tool. So... 
um, these are these are strictly ceremonial. But like I said, they're much lighter. Although I'm sure somebody that is more knowledgeable on uh, Greek prehistory uh, would be able to show me examples, maybe of early lavaries from around the same time as that in the Norse. Now there are some interesting connections, and the reason people put this connection together is because the the metal age, the Bronze Age specifically we but even probably a little bit earlier in the copper age which transfers over with the neolithic and a lot of people don't realize that that when we talk neolithic is broad there's also there is copper towards the end of it people have got metal tools obviously not as good as bronze but uh, it probably came with trade because they found uh, minoan copper in scandinavia from around 1700 bc so this double-headed axe uh, would definitely be a symbol maybe worn by one of the sailors trading there and maybe even an axe, a double-headed axe worn by one of the Norsemen travelling to Greece. Um, so there would be some connections somewhere along the line. Um, interesting, to, um, interesting to note here that there is a genetic similarity between uh, the ancient North and the Minoan civilizations. I made an error. Well, I don't believe I made an error, but I couldn't find a study in my Cimbrian video where I said Mesolithic connections. They had a great similarity. The Minoan culture had a great similarity to Mesolithic. I could not find that study, but I found studies, and I'll probably put a link in at some point, studies that uh, did show that one of the closest, uh, the, the closest genetic people to um, the Minoan civilization was the Neolithic uh, Swedes and French and, and Northern France, but they didn't test the British but or um, or other areas. It was just a limited test. So given that they, so we can pretty much say the ancient North. So there is some kind of connection there. Maybe that hammer, maybe that double-headed axe comes from a time this Neolithic time where there was some connection, some early connection. Now, I'm not going to go into who went where and when. That's a whole other topic. I know people like discussing that, east, west, west, east, who went north, south, south, north. Um, but I'm not going to go into that tonight. It's far too big a topic to get into. But I just wanted to put that out there. And there's a, I'm just going to continue with this a little bit because we also have the Northern European, in Northern Europe and a, South, we have to sp in actually fact all over Europe, we get a spiral starting to appear. Now, this could be to do with uh, copper tools becoming available, um, and people making better tools that they're starting to carve into. Um, they're starting to carve into a uh, rock, uh, but also early movements of people. These cultures are definitely spreading. Uh, we're getting similarities. That bottom picture with the the bottom center picture, that's 3000 BC. Uh, and on the left is a Swedish object found from around 3000 BC. On the right is a Greek object found around 3000 BC. And you can note the similarity. Um, the top, top center is obviously from uh, Newgrange. But we'll get to that one in a minute. On the right, we have some Minoan pottery. And on the left, we have some Minoan pottery. We can also start seeing some other symbols starting to appear in these uh, swirls. But we'll leave that for another time. Um, but the top center, I'd like to just go on that. Because some people have these, these double spirals. And I was meant to include a picture of the double spirals in Greek archaeology, which I forgot to do. But these double spirals are also associated with a mother goddess. Uh, some people even consider them to be her eyes. Um, and it's an interesting connection. I just wanted to elaborate there. And also something to remember, and the reason I want to talk about the mother goddess here, although I don't believe overall the symbol as the false hammer, and this to do it, there is some connection to femininity, although it's a very masculine symbol, but we'll get to that. Because in burials, at least, are false hammers, mjolnirs. Uh, it's mostly women. Mostly Viking Age women that are wearing them in burials. We do have evidence from England, especially from mass graves, that men were wearing them uh, when they were buried informally. Um, we do find them on, male, on males, but when we have formal burials, 
the force hammer is almost exclusively associated with females. Um, so the, the, there's some kind of thing going on there, maybe some kind of balance, but we'll try and take a bit of a look at that. And I just wanted to add this as a little bit more to the spe uh, connection of this little tangent I'm going on. And uh, it leads me into another intrigue. But uh, I'm going to have to get some water because I didn't realize. So what I'm going to do is I do have a video set up. I wanted to leave it, leave it to a little bit later. Um, but I'm just going to do that now so I can grab some water. Uh, it's true romance. It's about balance. It was meant to be a bit later because it would make more sense. But uh, I'll catch you in uh, five. For a man, his greatest romance is with death. From a child, he dreamed of battlefield dancing, of heroic charge, of fearless arrogance in face of insurmountable odds. No matter the deed, no matter the valor, without the complete sacrifice, without the finality of action, it would always appear lacking. The Spartans imagined war a dance, a dance of glory. And if by heroic daring, one proved himself worthy, she, the mother of gods, would take him home. The Vikings in a similar vein would compete in acts of courage, in the hope that they were chosen that their thieves would stand above all others, so that Valkyrie would swoop down and take them to Valhalla. Here they would meet with the Lord of Asgard himself, fighting and dying daily in preparation for the final and insurmountable battle of Ragnarok. In this way he conquers that which cannot be conquered. He gives meaning and purpose to the void. In his final action, he stands above it and becomes immortal. He gives himself completely. In an altruistic sacrifice of flesh, So his kin may bathe in the magnificent light of the dawn. Another day. For a woman, her romance is with life. From the moment she pulls her firstborn to her bosom, she begins her true love. The mother will go without food so her child may eat. The longer she can suffer this, the greater her sense of pride. The father, being represented by the moon, forever waxing and waning, in battle and hunt, may leave the sky empty. But the mother was the ever-present. Like the sun, the mother was the only constant. Even when the world was gripped by chaos, she would still rise to cast out darkness. In her arms, serenity is ruler. With soft whisper, she can encourage and revitalize. Thus her children saw in the sun 
her likeness and elevated her to the most high. If the father gave himself up at the altar of war for tribal survival, she became the embodiment of primal endurance. She is the life giver to those under her protection. But ferocious and unforgiving to those who would cause her children harm. She has brought kings and empires to their knees if they wronged her. Thus her children name the primal forces of nature, mother in her honor. The ultimate and final sacrifice of the male combined with the constant and enduring sacrifice of the female, became the unconquerable foundation of the northern folk. Created in nature and ordained by deities, this union became the indomitable force in the eternal struggle that is life. The warrior representing death and the mother life, death and resurrection are realized in the truly holy, the union of man and woman. Through an unyielding adherence to natural duty, this union bore noble and willing children. In this way it became the phoenix of the folk. The eternal rebirth. Sorry for that abrupt uh, jump off there. Um, I had a call of nature on my own. Uh, and that's some beautiful music there composed by uh, Halinda for that uh, that last video. Actually, I was meant to link that a little bit later to so make more sense. And I've gone back to the start. Oops. On my uh, slides for some reason. Um, that's the next slide we're going to get into. But... Um, before I start, yeah, that makes a bit more sense, and I'll relate a little bit of it now because we just touched on it. With the false hammer being buried with the female, we may have an instance in that video, a little clue as to why. Maybe, I mean, of course, this is speculation, we don't really know, but uh, maybe if the father had given himself up at the altar of war, that the mother then went and take on the full burden of responsibility and there, therefore maybe wear the axe as a symbol of that. Um, but now, just in relation, I know we've got a bit of a tangent here. I was just looking at spirals, and you might think, where's this going? What's this got to do with an axe? It does have a little bit of relation. As I said, the mother goddess starts to play a role here, especially in the south, with the axe symbology. And some people believe that these chambered tombs in France, which you can see on the slides now, also show this. These tombs are considered mother tombs. Um... And some people relate them to those double, uh, the eyes, uh, the spiral eyes. Um, I haven't put a picture up of that, though, which I apologize for. But there's something interesting here. I feel it's more about balance because because we have the hammer, clearly a hammer, an axe, possibly an axe in the bottom right. We'll get onto that in a little bit. Uh, associated with this tomb of the mother. Um, there is uh, the mother goddess right in the center there. And there's an interesting thing that you'll note with the eye, the, the top of the head. Still, it looks a little bit like an axe. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that there's a connection there, but it leads us into some interesting things and some interesting ideas, actually. These are Neolithic too, by the way, so they're around the same time. 
a little yeah around the same time as the the uh, Fon Beaker culture except this is uh, I forgot what culture it is now but anyway um these are in uh, France uh, Coizard Marne uh, well, I probably butchered that but uh I'll put a link maybe and people can look at it like I say, I'm not. Some people seem to, when they were making connections in some research papers I was reading about the double headed axe, the mother goddess, they were starting to relate. You know, I think that they've gone down a little bit of a wrong angle here. And I think it's about the, the balance of this temple. But this goddess figure, especially the head shape, the top of the head, relates to something that this is a bit of a big tangent now, but it's something I wanted to put out there. Um, the Ermin Saw connection. We're going to go back again with the Ermin Saw connection here. And it's a little, like I say, a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's important. I don't know fully what to make of it yet, but there's a lot in it that suggests some kind of connection, maybe with Thor and the Hammer. Now, these in front of us here are uh, statue menhirs, as they're called. Menhirs are just standing stones. So these are just carved standing stones like people. Now, you'll notice here on the left, um, we have a female figure, and I didn't I didn't put enough slides on this earlier slide here. I didn't put enough pictures to show, but there are similar depictions with this necklace and some kind of pendant on it, but you can't really see it. What it is, the pendant appears a lot on the female. Shows the male is always seen there. We see the male men her. He's got a hammer. Um, these slides might be a bit too small, but all these men hers, the fa the ma masculine ones at least, have a hammer. Um, in the bottom right there, and it's really small, and I do apologise again. I'm going to have to get better with the slides. We almost have the force hammer shape, uh, almost depicting horns with the string attached to the bottom, almost. But uh, again, that's just an interesting thing. I'm not saying that is a false hammer at all. I'm just saying that it's an interesting shape. And when we're looking at symbols, we have to look at the shapes. Um, these are a continuation of these standing stones. Now, another thing to add with these, uh, these standing stones is there were a lot of standing uh, wooden posts that would have been carved that obviously, because they're made of wood, an organic material, we've lost them. So they could have been going back even a lot further than this. Um, but we we'll never know because they're lost. And that's something that we need to remember about archaeology as well. Um, the archaeological record that we have is minuscule compared to what was there. For every axe head we find, there are probably a thousand or more that have lost to time, been remelted down or eroded or just gone. And this is true of every single archaeological find we go have. And as further we go back, that percentage of what we have is even smaller. So when we look at the archaeological record, we, we must make sure that we understand that we don't have it all. Um, and that's an important thing to make. But just to just to try and push this along with the urban soul a little bit. Uh, well, this is just a quick slide on the mystery symbol. People don't know what that symbol is. I kind of think it's a top, kind of looks to me like the top of an axe head. Looks from, you know, an, un, an unshafted axe head. Um, make of that what you will. These symbols appear. That's one in the cave. That's on a statue menhir. And that's a, uh, a contemporary axe head. Um, and if we look back at these slides, we can see that there's, that's clearly a hammer on the left, and that could be an axe head on the bottom right there. We're pushing this long Kirk and Stele. They're around the same time, maybe a bit earlier. Now, the important thing to remember these is the eye shape. Um, this eye shape is uh, very interesting because it's starting to look a little bit like an ermine saw or the classical shape of one. Um, and like I say, we see a similar axe type thing in the the French tombs. And of course, that one there on the left, you can't see it that well, but at the bottom, there is a crude carving of a hammer. 
On the right there, that's one found. These are all found in the east. The Kurgenstiele are more eastern European, whereas the statue Menhirs are more western European. Here on the far right, we see he's got a hammer and an axe. He's got several axes. There in the center, we have some like a child with an axe at the bottom. But that is a male figure. I didn't put a female figure on there, and I'm sorry, but female figures have the small circles to indicate a breast. And they have that same necklace that we see here, this, this banded necklace with a chain uh, with, with something hanging from it. Now, how does this all relate? Oh, I just want to note here with the Kurgan Snile, um, the Jaina stones in Ireland, although they're considered much later, and I should have put a slide in here, and I really apologise for that, but you can look them up. Very similar to that one on the left, um, in eye pattern and eye shape. Um, so that eye shape considers, what, can we link this any further to the Ermansaw? And what does it mean? Now, I'm not going to tell you what it means because I'm a bit confused with this myself, but these are stones. Now, these don't have a hammer. Interesting to note, but these are Herma stones and Terminus stones. Um, early, early Herma stones are just cans, piles of rocks. We see that in the North too, in the Neolithic. And later Herma stones, as you can see there, are generally a head and genitalia, male genitalia. Um, they're associated with boundaries, which is interesting because obviously we have the association with uh, the axe with boundaries, which I didn't cover earlier, but man is dominant, uh, taking control over his land. He's setting up boundaries now of territory. Um, this becomes important because even in the Mesolithic, we're saying that this is my forest. This is the forest that I work. This is the forest that I control. Now, here we have these Herma stones that are boundaries, and people would uh, give gold uh, to them, put coins. Sim we have similar traditions in the north, especially in the Iron Age. We know that these things went on. And uh, there on the far right is a, a rough depiction of Terminus, a Greek god. A uh, very, very mysterious god. Um, he's the god of boundaries. Uh, we get the word terminal, uh, airport terminal, uh, as a boundary, Terminus, terminal. Now, you can see there I've put some words in here just to uh, show some similarities. We have can which is a, a pile of rocks. And we have her, Herma, Hermstone, sometimes called, without the A. And we can relate that to Hearn, Hearn the Hunter, maybe. Right? So we have a, an interesting idea there, Hearn the Hunter, the boundary of the forest. Maybe he's the opposite in the sense that he controls the wild places, man controls. The, maybe we're talking about the edges of territory. That would kind of make sense. And he is, of course, generally considered horned or related to Cairnunos, Cairn, horned. Cairn is horned or I think the word actually means, comes from a word from protrusion, standing out. And obviously when we can relate Herma to Terminus, and we can do this through the urban soul, uh, nobody really brings this up, but Terminus is a god of boundaries and we erect statues or figures there, but the Romans did, although like I say, he's an obscure deity that by the time of Roman prominence has really gone out of um, mass usage, but probably was more used earlier on. This could make sense with the Roman Empire as it didn't see any boundaries to its empire, so maybe it had no use for a, a boundary guard anymore. But uh, Terminus, Erminsul, Termin, Ermin, Hermin. We start to see there's a little bit of a connection there, but like I said, there's no hammer here um, with these. But uh, I thought this was just interesting. And before we move on, we'll just look at the classical form. Uh, there on the left there um, is the symbol, is where we get the classic form from. We see a man, some kind of religious priest, standing on the urban soul, um, which has that very, uh, this shape here. It's very similar across the eyes. And we see this in the King of Steely. 
And there it is in the center. And there it is as an oak. Uh, they're replacing the ermine saw there on the left with a cross. And we have the ermine saw tree as a, as a tree. Um, like I say, the form is interesting given what we um, looked at before. And uh, if we remember the eye shape, I'm not going to spend too long on this. Just check the chat. People are saying can is a Celtic word. It is a Celtic word. Uh, and it actually comes from protrusion to stand out, as I said. But here's Donna's oak and Tyrannis. Uh, if we connect the ermine saw to an oak tree or tree, uh, we could connect it to Donar's oak. Um, now, there's an interesting thing here because we have uh, the word tannin. Tannin comes from a word for oak. Um, tannin is what you use to tan leather. Now, tarannis can also be called tanaros. In certain cultures. Now, although they have a, a, a very different etymological root, they start to end up the same. And this is something we're going to be looking at here. Um, and Tyrannus, of course, is the uh, thunder god of, uh, some, of some Gaulish, of the Gauls. Now, I just wanted to note here that Donar's Oak, um, we have a similar transfer over, because Tyrannus, Donar's Oak, so we have tannin, and uh, tannin is actually a very interesting thing because it's present in bogs as well. It's a preservation thing. So bogs are boundaries, so we get another boundary connection here and preserves the bodies. But I'm not going to go into all of that. I just want to make that connection. The sacred oak, tannin from oak, and we see in the Proto-Germanic that the TD switch that we see in a lot of things like uh, uh, for Donor. We see the same, and Dano can mean anything from uh, tannin in, in its origin can mean oak, pine, woods. It's, it's associated with wood. Um, and I just wanted to mention that in relation to the urban soil and its connection possibly to four, four and its connection possibly to the, the shape, the form of the urban soil and the axe connection, the hammer axe connection with the earlier Medhurs. Like I say, I haven't made full sense of this, but I just wanted to uh, mention it. And just uh, the, one of the last times we hear about the urban soil being erected was in about 510. Hadu Gato uh, of the Saxons erects one after his uh, victory, after his victory over the Thuringians. And I believe, now I couldn't find... Um, a reference to this, but I believe I did read that he erected it on the ba on the edge of water and land. He erected it on the edge of the banks of the river, which again would signify a barrier, land, living, water, death, of a movement maybe of the heroes. Um, and it is said about Hadugato that they declared him possessed of divine courage and godlike valour, who by his constancy had led them to, to win such a victory. And then they erected the ermine soul in his honour. Godlike courage and valour, well, we instantly start to think of four. And then they re erect the ermine soul. Like I say, that's a little bit of a tangent. Make of it what you will. will. But there's something there. It needs a lot of deeper research. Something I didn't have time to for this. Um, but something that occurred to me whilst I was doing the research. And I just wanted to put it out there. But now we'll get back on track. So sorry for that. If people were looking for just the hammer axe, I just thought I'd put it out there. Now after, well, another crossover here. Uh, battle axe culture doesn't come after funnel. The, the, the funnel beaker culture. It crosses over. It comes around 2008. And so at the tail end of funnel beaker culture, there's both battle axe culture and funnel beaker culture um, living side by side. Um, so some people speculate this is a new people coming in. Although in this uh, slide here, you can see uh, on the left is a funnel beaker grave goods and on the right is a battle axe grave goods. So there's, there's not much difference in it uh, from a burial perspective. The burials look very similar. 
Um, the main difference is shape of the axe, although it's interesting in those... Uh, I, I'm not sure if the, where I got those from, though it was an academic piece, they got the pictures the wrong way around. Because it would look more like a double axe head in the battle axe culture slide, uh, and it looks more like a battle axe, axe head in the front of Beaker uh, grave. But the, either way, these axes now are both permanent. The front of Beaker... I mean, the battle axe culture, we see the hammer definitely develop here on the end of the, the axe. We have an axe and a hammer. They're, they're famous for this, uh, for this type of axe. It's also known as the boat axe because of its boat shape. And we know it could have even been slightly shaped on a boat because of later things, but we'll get to that. As you can see, the bottom right there... Um, some false hammers in the Viking Age actually have a ball on the end. Uh, so could this be a symbol of that? We don't have... Well, I say we don't have... I, don't, I haven't seen any pendants of these uh, made by the Battle Axe sculpture. But nevertheless, it's uh, interesting. And again, the axe is still being found in burials. The axe and the hammer uh, are still being found in bur burials. So... It's still got a spiritual significance. Now, I'm just going to jump over, just check. Now, uh, here we go to the Nordic Bronze Age. Now, this it starts to get a little bit more interesting here because we have a lot more to go on in tracing this hammer axe symbol back. Like I say, we know from earlier... Uh, they were making pendants, so we know it had spiritual significance, but now we can start to find some context. Now, obviously, the Nordic Bronze Age rock art, especially in Sweden, although there is some in Denmark, although it's not as elaborate as the Swedish rock art, and this is mostly southern Sweden, um, and connected heavily to the, uh, the Danish culture, just like von Obika. But um, we see the axe all over the place on these... Uh, the axe is obviously a great tool. Now, it's a tool, as we said earlier, for clearing forests. But it's also a tool of war. Um, and even interestingly, we'll go into this a little bit later, but we can see in that center, pitch, center top picture there, we have what many consider some kind of wedding. There's two people kissing, and above them, presiding over them, is a man with an axe or a hammer, an axe hammer. And he appears to be presiding over the wedding. Many people have noted this. This is not something exclusive here. but So it gives us maybe two new main uses. We see that it is obviously prolific in war. Um, but also it's starting to be used as order. Now this makes sense. Um, the realm of men needs order. And who better than that which controls the realm of men? The axe. Um, so we're starting to get more context and more uh, details on, on the specifics of this. We're going to get, when I get to the summary and the meaning, I'll get into this, but I just want to establish some ideas. I'm also possibly a sign of victory. They're always holding their axes high. Um, and these are obviously victory. I haven't included a slide there, but we can clearly see that the ones that hold their axes high in some slides are dominating over people bent and kneeled as in they've, They've yielded, they've lost, and they have no axe. Um, so the axe as a sign of victory and order is starting to um, show itself. Also, we have, uh, you know, uh, people often talk about the Viking Age. Uh, I have often uh, speculated, when did the Viking Age start? I mean, we clearly have here in the Nordic Bronze Age what looks like Viking Age warfare. They're carrying on boats. Those boats are very similar to later Iron Age boats. Some are more elaborate with their ends, um, as we'll see in a bit. I think we might see in a bit anyway, but if not, I'll explain it a little bit more. But um, So we're getting some very... So I just wanted to make a point about the Viking Age. I mean, the people of the North have been sea travellers for a very long time. And maybe this is partly due... To, maybe this is explains some of their connections with the Greeks and some of the Greek similarities, which... Actually, this show was going to be about, but I got so carried away with the hammer and axe that I decided to just do a whole show on that. In the next slide, now, uh, 
Just wanted to make a reference to the Horned Man again because he's going to come up later in a bit. But he starts showing up with hammers here. And remember in the very first slide we had it and there was a little bit of a hint of it in some of the menhas. We're here on the left there, the top left, I mean, there's a Horned Man. Um, he doesn't appear to have a hammer, but he could be riding a goat chariot and that could be lightning just in front of his uh, manhood there. Um, is that a very early depiction of Thor? Uh, from the Nordic Bronze Age. But we do have horned figures holding, generally, unlike the rest of the people now, they're holding a hammer. Um, most, we, we see, and there's an interesting shape on, in the central one there, with the horned figure with the big hand. Um, if you look on his belt, he has something again, remember the eye shape of the, the Kurgan stele and the cave and then the form of the ermine saw. He has something very similar to that on his belt. Um, so again, we have that little bit of a connection to the ermine saw. I'm just checking my notes here to make sure. I don't have anything, but again, could he be an authority figure, ordainment of weddings, consecration of land, as we see later? But uh, that's definitely an interesting piece of rock on the top left there, when we connect into the Thunder God with the horns. Now, we're going to have a look at this, this connection in the real world, in the art in archaeology, uh, or art in the artifacts. Now here we have some of the axe heads that would have been deemed being depicted in that rock art. That rock art is from the Bronze Age, so it's depicting Bronze Age material. We have Bronze Age stuff. It's not, it's not, it's not Neolithic or uh, anything like that. So there's horned helmets that we see. Maybe that's the sign of the chief who's presiding over things, who's leading. And they're the Vexo helmets. They're they're beautiful, and there's some beautiful axes there. I probably should have included the axes. They actually look similar to those on the right. Uh, that figure there is a statue that was found that is no longer with us of um, this divine twin aspect. They've got the horned hats. Now, it's interesting to note that the statue on the left, as we look at it, has one eye. Um, just out of interest. Uh, there's part of a similar statue where we've lost the axe, the axe arm, and we've lost his twin. But we have a part of it at least. And we see that jumping person there too that was found with it. And we see the ho in this picture here at the bottom left. But at the bottom we see on the left we have the horned man. And then we have this jumping figure. So I'm not sure what the jumping figure significance is. But we also uh, find it in uh, other cultures. But maybe that's for another show. So we're starting to get a twin aspect. Now I'm just putting that out there. And put out with the, the connection with the axe, the authority, and just wanted to show. Uh, but it just shows the Vikings did wear horns before we called them Vikings, maybe. Uh, a lot of people go, Vikings didn't wear horned helmets. Well, in the Bronze Age, they did, or the people that became them. Now, another little connection to the Urban Soul, because this is actually quite interesting. Uh, Noted on that uh, guy's belt earlier in the picture, we had this. Now, this is, some people see these as mushrooms, but I put a Bronze Age axe in there to try and show you what they might be representing. Again, that Bronze Age axe looks very much like a classical shape of an ermine saw. These on the left here and at the bottom right there, they are razors, Nordic uh, Bronze Age razors. Very interesting. Um, piece of archaeology, exceptionally beautifully decorated. And a lot of them have these boats with this uh, tree, ermine saw type, axe type uh, feature to them. Some of them you can't see too well, but some of them have kind of like branches coming off them. Um, some are much smoother. They look like the axe in the picture there. Uh, we see in the rock art there, we see that these these things come up too and they see the man carrying holding that up um 
so maybe that's another connection to the omen soul and its form and its shape and the axe and four i don't know it's up to you to uh maybe have a look at this yourself and see what you think now before we move out of the uh bronze age uh, this is ruskar and stonehenge now those figures on the left there are ruskar figures um found in england uh and they found quite a, quite a few of them not just at ruskar but they're just interesting because they show kind of a an invasion fleet that we see in the rock carvings which i just found interesting now on the right there that is stonehenge it's one of the stones at stonehenge and it's got a lot of these shapes on them which look like axe or what we see on the boat a hell of a lot now people date these to the bronze age now there's the whole issue of problem of dating stone monuments in general let alone carvings on them and we have to do it by stratigraphic and what's there at the bottom what we consider floor level if that floor level was kept clean for a very long time though you wouldn't have any mess under it so we i have some dubious uh I think we're too quick to try and find a date too quick to try and find something to date um things by in this age but they do date it to the bronze age and it can kind of make sense but it could have been earlier given the prominence of the axe symbol but these are all over some of the stones i mean like that's a that's a heavy amount of them there um so make of that what you will i just wanted to add it in there that uh we get this like i say some of these tangents i'm just presenting some information Maybe a lot of you there will have things that you can add to it, or maybe it will inspire you to look deeper and find your own and to find more information. Like I said at the beginning, the greatest thing we can be doing here is engaging with the gods and goddesses, engaging with our ancestors. That's what it's all about. Um, on a side note here, uh, I think in the uh, Bronze Age, there was a Bronze Age settlement in the UK where they dug and they found a collection within this Bronze Age settlement of ancient artifacts from the Neolithic and earlier periods in the Bronze Age. Um, and they found they were all piled together. So these were not in context to each other. They were not in their original positions. Yet somebody in the Bronze Age had, had kept all of these or found all of these ancient things and kept them in a place. It just shows that our interest in these things of the past, our interest in what our ancestors were doing, has always been prominent, even their, their, their implements. Now, slide uh, 20. Before we leave the Bronze Age, we've got to take a little bit at the Kivik grave or the King's grave. Um, one second, I just wanted to check something. Oh, okay. sorry about that. Um, the Kivik grave. Because it was about 1400 BC, um, and it's a very interesting grave. There we can see clearly the axe heads. If you remember those axe heads on the left there, if we go forward again. We can see them there on the, the big picture. Uh, that is a reconstruction. That, that's a reconstruction of what it would look like because that's a heavily damaged one. We see the axes again there as prominence. We see that axe shape with the curved edges, the solar wheel there. Now, I'm going to have to just take a quick break. Sorry. Uh, I'll be really fast. I'm just going to have to use my break button because I don't have anything else. To, I don't have a video to put up, and I really apologize for this. I'll be back as fast as I can. Sorry, I just need to go urgently. Just something off uh, camera I need to deal with. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, see you in a minute.
Uh, I'm back now. Sorry for that. I've been a little bit under the weather lately, so I'll leave it at that. But um, I do apologise. Uh, hopefully I'm back now and everybody can hear me. So I didn't set up my slides right, so I've got to go through everything again. Oh, there's some great images there. Um, and yeah, I was at the Kivik grave, the King's grave from 1400 BC. A beautiful grave. And I'd just like to mention that... Uh, Thank you for the d donations over at um, D Live. I know Verbo Tempestus, Roy Danton, Neptune, and Jay Fox have all donated there. We do really appreciate it. Um, for people not on D Live, we do have a uh, Ko fi donation if people want to. Uh, Donate, although it's not mandatory at all. We present this information for our folk and all of our work is for free, of course, and always will be. Now back to the stream. Um, the Kivik Grave. Yeah, we see the axe, the prominence. This is a burial, very, very prestigious burial, uh, especially for the age. There's not really any like it. And we see the axe symbology lining the grave. Uh, similar to we saw the axes or the hammers lining the graves of the in France, but that was a very mother goddess tomb. Um, but yeah, very most people are probably aware of this grave. If not, just Google the Kivik grave and you'll find out a lot more imagery. There's a lot more interesting imagery here that's related to other things. But uh, I'm trying to keep it a little bit on a uh, on track here, although I have gone on a few tangents. But I can't help myself. Uh, tangents, I just find them interesting and where there's a connection. Even if I don't know the full answer, I like to put it out there so people can make their own uh, decisions. Now, I've lost my place on my notes too, so just give me a second. And sorry about this. Not very professional of me. But uh, trying to do the, the new style of uh, the slides has been challenging in many ways, but I suppose it's uh, relevant to the stream. <laughs> Now, the Iron Age, I'm at a bit of a loss. Uh, I probably did. I probably needed a bit more time to look into it. Uh, I'm sure you guys there could probably add something to this. Um, the bearded axe becomes prominent, and we see the bearded axe mostly resembled in the uh, axe of Perun. Uh, hammer, or not hammer, axe. Uh, now, on the right there, there a pa now there's a lot. Now, something I said earlier about archaeological finds, we only have a small fraction, and even worse than that, there's a hell of a lot on the black market. People will dig them and not report them and sell them on the black market because there's a lot of money in it. Sadly, I can find lots of images on the black market, all have gone through the black market and now on private auction sites, but there's no way to verify them. Uh, they could be genuine. But without any information, we don't know exactly when they're from. Uh, they will have their own appraisers um, in these areas. But they're apparently from the England in the Iron Age and their pendants. Uh, it bears, we'll see later that this would make sense with some later finds that we're seeing there. We've got a shears at the bottom left there. We've got a clear axe heads. Uh, look like Bronze Age axe heads. Um, although this is said to be from the Iron Age, but we don't know. Uh, because, like I said, there's, there's so many great images that I could use uh, from these sites, these great artifacts, but it's hard to use them in any authoritative manner when they're on a private auction site. I don't, I, I can't verify them. There's no scholar. Most images, all the images I use, I pull them from scholarly articles uh, and scholar, scholarly works, so at least I know about them. I know what I'm presenting. In this case, I can't prove anything uh, with those on the right, but it is interesting, and it is possible that they went through. Um, why is that? But um, yeah, so at the Iron Age, I'm in a little bit of a a loss there because there's not that much information on Thor's hammers or hammers or axes. Now, this could just be an oversight. Like I say, the urban soil we still get mention of a hell of a lot at this point. Maybe it's moved more into that area. I'm unsure. Uh, 
like I said, the bearded axe comes prominent here, and this is normally associated with axe pro, but I don't have any pendants. I found lots of bearded axe pendants. They claimed they were from the Iron Age, but again, like I say, I can't. It's the black market. I can't, I can't know where they're from. The archaeological context is completely gone, and it makes them almost useless for uh, trying to understand uh, anything. Now, uh, so what I'm going to do now is just jump to early official, although there's one picture in there that isn't considered a force hammer. These are early official hammers, and we can see here that they, some of them have a form of, well, an axe. Um, some have the form of a hammer. Some have the form of both. Uh, most of these, the, the two gold ones, are found in uh, the UK. Um, Now, but before we look at the others, that one in the top left there, along with the spearheads, is really early. Uh, about 600 AD, found in Kent, the UK. Way, so this is why people don't consider it a false hammer, or, or the scholars don't, because it's way too early. Uh, we don't see the false hammer appear in Scandinavia, or what official false hammers, like the ones on display here, till about um, uh, the 800s. This is about 200 years earlier. Um, but they were probably on a belt and they were found in female burials. So they have all the hall markings of a, uh, of a false hammer. Except they are scholar, archaeologists. And this is, again, what I said earlier about categories. Something that fits outside of the box, they don't like it, so they stick it in a new box. Um, and we get a, This is why categories, you need to look at things separately. But they were on a chain, which uh, a chain altogether, which they also say is on. But there's one from Sweden on the right there with lots of hammers. I think Burka maybe. I didn't write that down. But um, clearly lots of hammers on a chain. We see a similar thing in uh, Finland. They have many hammers uh, on their chains, not just one. But we can see with the early hammers, we've got a bit of a form of an axe and a hammer going on together. Now, as we move forward and we get to the more classical designs, they clearly start to resemble hammers. There in the top right, you can see the ball at the end, which resembles something of the boat axe culture, although the hammer itself looks nothing like a boat axe hammer uh, because it's got a, it, it, it shapes very differently. But that's a more classic shape of force hammer. I based the, the one that I made originally off the earlier ones. Uh, I can't really show you that well uh, maybe that will work but uh, I'm based off these earlier designs because I like their form I like their shape um, but they're the classic force hammers now before we move to any idea of um, meaning behind them although we've, we've I've touched on the meanings as we've gone but I'll, I'll put it all together at the end We've got to have to look at a little bit of four. Um, but we're going to look at the words. Because we all know what four does in the mythology. But the words show an interesting duality. The hero and the struggle. We have uh, Fur's giant demon. Uh, uh, it means giant demon. We, it's very similar to the uh, room poem, which we're going to take a look at too. For he, uh, his winter, for his blot, uh, winter, time of hardship for people. Your supplies are running low from the autumn. And in the winter solstice stream I did, I talked about looking forward and looking, taking reflection and presenting forward of this time, this dark time. And uh, who else would you call upon than for at this time? Very, to, to, for the ice, right? Although, fought in, in a battle, yeah? But they're not etymology collected, they're just interesting. Uh, I think the scholars call it folk etymology, they sound the same. Um, and, and these, uh, so we have Fori, uh, uh, the winter months, and he's a personification, although he's the prince, uh, personification of frost. And we have the Fors rune, 
or fawn, as we call it in the Anglo-Saxon. And then it's countered by force. We have all these aspects of adversity for man, the giant, the winter, the, these, the fawn, the nature's um, adversity. Because nature, I mean, as a heathens, we praise and respect and honor nature, but nature has harsh lessons for us. I wrote an article called on The Harshness of Nature, where I try to put that in context. Thor is a great example of putting that in context as he challenges these things. He meets them head on. He doesn't hide from them. Um, he becomes the archetypal hero in that sense. But the words I just wanted to make here, and I'm going to express this more with other words in a little minute, are bound up together. Where there is struggle, where there is adversity, we find the hero. Um, we also have the word per fur that comes for through associated with gates there's other words in the germanic language with gates so we have that boundary association again from the urban soul um like i say men's realm the realm of men uh, where the wild place is on the outside um uh, so we have that that boundary aspect just wanted to put that in there and now sorry about this i copy i i screen i, I uh took a snippet from Wikipedia because it was the easiest way to do it for a fast slide that I put together earlier today. But the, this is the rune poems associated with uh, the fawn rune. Um, the translations are pretty much the same as you'll see anywhere else. There's not much variation on translations. That's something that I wish to work on, although I haven't done any work on the, the fawn rune. So I can't, I'm going to take their word for it. I have done a little bit of work. Um, but I'm not going to go into any new translation. I'm going to keep the old translations here and just work from them because they're generally on some kind of plot. They're generally okay. Although there's no side, uh, there's no hidden meanings expressed. Now, first thing you'll know is that the fawn rune looks a little bit like an axe. Um, like I said, and I do apologize for using the Wikipedia. Uh, I could have typed it all out, but I was being lazy. And uh, although I've got books, I was also being lazy to uh, photo uh, scan the images. Um, but like I say, the translations are pretty much the same, so it doesn't really matter. And like I said, the first thing you notice, the fawn rune looks a bit like an axe. Yeah. Or a fawn. Nature. Like I say, the duality. The axe to chop down the fawn bushes. And anybody that's got a garden and knows about... Uh, Bramble bushes definitely know the axe and the uh, fawn go to war sometimes. Maybe a mini uh, idea of a uh, fawn and uh, nature as we try to clear uh, the wild places from our uh, gardens. But um, even though this is a rudimentary translation, or one that everyone accepts at least anyway, there's still some clues in it. We have a giant's anguish. The giant is the anguish of women, or four is the anguish of women, because people translate furs as giant. You shouldn't really do that, because furs is a rune, and the phrases, in my opinion, are telling you what the rune is. A giant has just become a personification of it in the Old Norse, whereas we've got fawn becomes a personification of it in the English. Uh, so uh, they talk about the fours is the cause of anguish to women. Now, it's quite... I would say that this is probably childbirth. We have some kind of natural aspect, natural struggle, and in it we find a natural struggle of a woman for sure. One that she cannot avoid in childbirth is the pain of childbirth. Not just, just the birth, but the carrying and anybody that's had a, anybody that's got a partner that's uh, been pregnant like I have and had children will know that. Uh, they suffer a great deal in that time. There's a lot of, uh, and we suffer too by uh, default. But um, but yeah, uh, so that would probably talk to that. And we also have a very interesting uh, thing in the old Icelandic, uh, Fatten, Saturn's Fane. Now, um, Saturn uh, being Kronos, time. Uh, so we're seeing that this is the instrument of destruction, of death. Instrument of time, instrument of hardship. So it's no wonder that four then comes into this poem. Well, 
4 becomes the adversary of this. And he shares the same name. Again, the words are entwined. They, uh, and we're going to see this further in the next one because we have the boar and the boar's connection to struggle and the hero. Uh, talk in Old Irish is wild boar, but it also means hero or chief. So we have a sacred kinship, kingship, which we'll get to as well soon. Now, interesting here, we, we have constant uh, ideas of the boar, boar warrior. We have the helmets, the boar helmets. They go right back, right back in time. Uh, I did an article on the boar helmets. I haven't finished it. I've got, I've got part one out, and that's the early boar helmets in the south. Again, we have the, the Minoan Mycenaean connection, and even the steppe peoples connection there. As we have the boar helmet, the struggle against the boar, uh, the boar being the opposite to the hero, or how the hero gains his worth. Obviously, uh, talk. Uh, Tor, our Swedish name for four, essentially. Uh, and interestingly, if a, a modern Irish person at least was going to say the word four, they would pronounce it Tor uh, because of the way they pronounce their THs. Um, Tor comes from twerk to cut. Uh, we essentially get the word pork as well. Uh, talk, pork, fork. You get, the, you get the connection with four, Tor. It's all there. Um, but, uh, and this also comes with the word for boar. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that because it'd just be way too much. But you'll just have to trust me on this. Now, this again isn't like, um, isn't necessarily direct etymological connections. Actually, the word boar is kind of a, a strange one etymologically. It comes from an earlier phase, uh, probably not Proto Indo European. So it's a very interesting word. But we can have some ideas and some. Uh, so uh, we can have some uh, ideas with the word boar, with the side etymologist. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to go into this in, in great deal. But the word boar, born, uh, comes from chamber in the ground or people on the ground. The boar, the boar of uh, South Africa, the common man, people on the ground, the chamber, they live in a chamber. So we kind of get an idea of birth. Uh, burden. Uh, there's some words like that that's similar to born, uh, the burden of carrying uh, the birth. So we have we have natural cycles on the feminine side, like we did above uh, with the four the uh, the fawn poem, and we have um, cycles on the male side, where the hero chief is named after the boar. Now we also have the talk necklace. Now although this is considered comes from the Latin. Uh, for twist, um, the uh, the old Irish, the twisting connection and the thing would would not be lost on them. And obviously, many talks are twisted. Now, again, there's some examples on the right of things on the black market. Again, these are pendants, boar tusk pendants. Um, there is evidence of these are things. Now, could this be a version of a talk, an earlier version of a talk that's lost, where we would make them out of uh, boar's tusks? Possibly. I'm not going to, that's a speculation completely, but uh, I'm just putting it out there. Because obviously the talk is, is part of the warrior, the hero's duty. Now, uh, the picture in the center there is of uh, Kulwick. Uh, and he's chasing a boar there. Because we have many boar mythologies, so do the Greeks. This is another interesting connection. And a very interesting connection with the boars and the Greeks, but we'll save that definitely for another show. But a cool worker marries Olwen. Now, Olwen is a personification of Earth. Uh, similar to Sif. Uh, but to get her hand, he has to do trials, kind of like Heracles. But he has a lot, like 50, I forget how many, but a lot of trials. Now, yeah, that is twerk, by the way, to cut. It's a proto in a European word, but um, the boar he hunt, he's hunting in this picture here is called twerk. Uh, twerk, uh, it's spelled T-W-R-C-H because it's a Welsh word, so you pronounce it how you want. Um, Welsh spellings are absolutely insane and I'm... Um, 
I'm sorry for uh, the, when they don't conv- contain vowels, I struggle. Um, but interestingly, with the Colwick and Owen story, where he's hunting boars, he's a great hero. He's actually uh, King Arthur's uh, cousin. Um, oh, and uh, Owen is a giantess, by the way, um, representing uh, Earth, as many uh, giants do represent some form of nature. But he fights for her hand and he has to do the trials. But interesting, um, Twerk, the boar he's chasing there, is said to be a man that was turned into a boar for, for being bad. I'm not, I forget the reason now. So it's Twerk, son of Tared in the, in the old Welsh or Celtic mythologies. But if you actually look to uh, uh, Breton, Northern France, their stories give us the names Ares, uh, Tor, Tor, son of Ares. So Tor, the boar becomes Tor, and his father is Ares, which is interesting. But again, we have this twine, entwined of words, where the same word can be used for the struggle and the hero. The same use and the boar, like I say, is connected to struggle. Whenever he appears... The Caledonian boar comes after they. Onius disrespects the mother goddess by not mentioning her. She sends down the boar, uh, the Caledonian boar, to ravage them for disrespect. So it's an element of nature, a harsh element of nature, harsh, the harsher side of the mother goddess. Um, and the hero has to step in to... So we have this nature-man balance. He's trying to... Uh, separate the wild places from the areas that are under control of men, order of men. And this is the job of the hero, to defend the boundaries, as we talked about, of man. And the wild places are not just wild by nature, wild by enemies, um, especially as the axe becomes more, pro- you know, the axe uh, smithing becomes more prominent, but we'll look into that. Now, I'm going to go on a little tangent again here because it's an interesting one. The Winter Struggle and Father Christmas. Is it Odin or is it Fall? There's a four on his chariot there and top right, as we saw. Well, possibly four. Uh, there we have some old greetings card where we have uh, Father Christmas there uh, feeding his goat. There's a Yule goat and there's a Father Christmas on the left riding a goat. Now, like I say, uh, four, four blot, four's blot is midwinter. Uh, time Christmas so who would you want to give you gifts gifts of courage gifts uh, than four when you're facing a struggle now like I say I'm not saying this is actually a fact uh, I'm just saying it's an interesting tangent but there is depictions of this um, <laughs> overcoming winter hardships uh, the red colour as well four is often depicted wearing red um, there were a lot more pictures I could have shared, but I just thought I'd put those in. Because obviously, uh, Woden or Odin rides Slipnir. Uh, he doesn't, doesn't ride on a sleigh, uh, but Thor does. Now, like I say, that's just a little bit of a tidbit there. People can make it what you will. Maybe a lot more research to do in it, but it's something that's interesting that came to me when it came to me and Riss actually when we were talking about it because uh, it just made a little bit of sense, uh, symbolically at least. But anyway, that's just a little tangent there. Now, before I begin to sum up, I'm just going to overlay some of the ideas presented. Neolithic, the importance of access. We see man starting to really control his environment, bringing order to the natural world or, or to, to nature. In summer, nature is beautiful. In winter, it's harsh. We need to bring order to our realm. And we see this. There's some stone. There's farming. I mean, it's modern farms, obviously. I can't give you a picture of the Neolithic. I'd love to, but uh, it's kind of impossible. But modern farms there with some Neolithic stones. Man's starting to put boundaries around his land. He's starting to command the land. 
And he needs to work in harmony with the land, though. This is something that really needs to be stressed here, something we're going to talk about a little bit later, that you can't just chop everything down and grow for it. You need to take care of the land. And this is where we get the, uh, uh, the sovereign kingship. But uh, we'll get into that a little bit. And axe to hammer, just to overlay, we see it, there, we see it a little bit, but uh, with a change of age. Um, one of the things was most important in the Neolithic was the axe uh, as, as a tool, an implement to clear wars. But as technology developed and war became more important, uh, we see a massive, for people that don't know, there's a massive increase in warfare in the Bronze Age. Uh, people are really going at it as populations increase. Uh, there's, there's a need for land. Those boundaries need to be, you know, you've just cleared that farming land. Well, those guys over there need it. They've got a growing population and they're going to try and take it from you. So we see the idea of technological race become more important than the clearing of land. So maybe the axe, especially... Now, we can see this a little bit, and we're going to, we're going to this in a minute, but um, force hammers present themselves, appear more commonly in massive clusters around Christian settlements. So we see the idea of battle warfare and the need to call upon for and his symbol at these times of adversity. So in a, as a technological race began to take form, it makes sense that the hammer... Uh, becomes more prominent tool of thought. Um, now that's really it for the slideshow, but we're going to go into it in an order of adversity, I've called it, but we're going to look at it. But that's really it for the slideshow, so I'll move back to the uh, camera now. The full camera, we'll look into the meaning. Um, some of the meanings involved here, and I can bring the chat back in a little bit now as well, so I can see it. Now, as I said there, the symbol moves through time uh, from an axe possibly to a hammer. And I give us some reasons, like I say, speculative, my opinions based on research. And I just want to say as well, I may change my own opinion on some of the things I've said in two, two three, five, ten years because as my knowledge increases, um, I have to relook at everything to make sure I didn't miss something or I misunderstood something. And that's just the nature of learning, the nature of being a seeker of knowledge, not a knower of knowledge. Um, as a symbol moves through time now some people might get confused here and go well how can the god or deity change well they don't the god or the deity or the force or however you want to see it remains constant uh, for and the force hammer a rep it doesn't matter what the force hammer looks like or what force looks like to a point it is what it represents and it represents man's struggle with his world Man's struggle against adversity. So the God doesn't change. That struggle has always been there. You may see that uh, if we found, if we could talk to some Neolithic people, they may embody four with a spearhead uh, because they're hunters. They're hunter-gatherers. Um, as we need farming, they will embody, they would give him a, an axe. Because remember, we're, we're, we're turning the gods and goddesses into human form so we can understand them. They're not human form. Maybe they, I mean, maybe they are, but my personal belief is that these are beyond our perception. Uh, but they exist and they are constant. What, how we see them is, is related to how our world. We're the lens by which we see the divine. We're the lens by which we see nature. Um, we can interpret their... Uh, their nature through our reality. And our reality is the age we live in. So for the Neolithic man, the axe was a good way to interpret it, man's command of nature, how he had, facing the adversity of nature and taking control of his world, essentially making a mini world within a larger world. Um, but in the... Uh, the Bronze Age, and as we move into the Iron Age, it was, he would maybe turn into a blacksmith as technology becomes important and a race and a fight for survival to make the weapons of warfare and the tools for uh, 
It, it's showing man's mastery of nature, man's mastery of his realm. So the, the God does not change, just our, interpret our, our vision of him changes. And I just wanted to stress that because people then go, well, he had this, he had that, what does he have? We have to understand that we're just observe, trying to observe the divine and explain the divine through means that we, un, that, that we can interpret. So he's always represented man's battle for survival, his battle with hardship, his battle of control in the land. And as I said, this is, doesn't matter, it's not just nature. He's not just battling against the hardships of nature, but also men, other men. Like you say, the Christians, you find false hammers in massive clusters around next to Christian settlements. They're under threat. Uh, their boundaries are being encroached upon by an alien idea. So they call upon Thor, they call upon his symbol to make an oath uh, that they will face uh, the adversity. And they ask for false courage uh, to do that. Now we get the idea of order. We still see this today, actually, with a judge's gavel, etc. Uh, order. The hammer is the, the order of the realm. And whatever symbol that Thor would be carrying would be the order. As he uh, consecrates the land, anybody that's uh, well read about or done uh, their own blots, we know that you consecrate. The force hammer is the mo one of the most uh, important integral parts of that ceremony where you, you establish the boundaries, your boundaries of your ceremony. You ask for, for, you ask for force assistance in that, and the man carrying the hammer is the representative of four in that aspect. Uh, so, we, so what does the symbol represent? Well, we have war, work. Battle of war, a, battle, a tool of war, a tool of work, and a tool of order. It is the man's realm. It is the, the realm of men. Uh, he brings order to the world of men. Settlement, farming communities, like I say, it begins there. As a, well, it probably begins earlier than that, but really uh, starts to begin there where we need to. Bring that order. He's the divine hero. I mean, almost an archetypal hero. I mean, like a, a perfect hero. He steps in to protect his land. He's married to Sif, the farming communities. Uh, she has flaxen hair. Uh, I should have got a slide for that. Flaxen hair is a... looks like beautiful blonde hair. Uh, flax, flaxen, uh, flaxen uh, threads. A marriage of the sky and the earth. Uh, like I say, a div uh, divine marriage, as they would call it in, uh, in the mythologies. Uh, the waters below, the waters above, this union, the rain, the thunderstorm. Thunderstorms obviously become important for crops too. Rain, rain becomes very important when you're growing crops. And uh, Thor obviously protects Sif, protects his land. Like I say, it's a, a, sacred, a sacro uh, sacred kingship. Uh, sovereign kingship. We get this enough in mythologies where man appears to marry the land. Uh, uh, the king or chief will marry the land bring or uh, and bring order for his tribe. So that part portion of the land that he has married becomes just like his, his, his physical wife, something that he must protect. He mustn't abuse because there's you don't scorn nature. You know, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and you don't scorn your wife. You need harmony within your community, and Thor brings that with his, his judge's gavel, his order. He makes sure that people keep in harmony with nature. Like I say, because, well, early Neolithic farmers, actually, there is some evidence that they may have mismanaged their land. Um, so this aspect of order would be even more important. As topsoils eroded, they because they were new to farming, they didn't really. It took them a, a little bit to understand that they had to hold on. They had to preserve those topsoils um, because it's you know. Um, so this order, this not abusing nature, not abusing our community, and like I say, he marries Sif and protects Sif. You know, uh, 
when Loki trying to cut off her hair, etc., etc. I'm not going to go into all the myths because I don't know how long we've been going, but probably about two hours. So uh, I'm not going to go into. I'm just going to try and wrap it up now. So he's a protector. He's a bringer of order. Now, just a little bit here, because he's bound up eternally with the struggle, and you might think, well, this struggle, why is this struggle aspect there? Well, as I cover a little bit in the, uh, on the Harshness of Nature article, and I'll put a link somewhere when I put this, when, when, I, when I get time, um, it's not about, nature's not trying to be punish you, it's trying to make you better. Now, just a very, very simple way to understand this is through weightlifting. Uh, if you do not have resistance, you will not get bigger or stronger. You know, resistance makes you stronger. So the mother goddess in this respect is a mother make, to make you strong. For, wants to make you strong. He wants to push you to take on that adversity. He swims, um, you know, calm, is it? I've got it written somewhere. But anyway, he swims across the, the river between Asgard. Uh, boiling hot waters, they say. Uh, instead of using the bridge, he chooses to do that. He chooses... Uh, I mean, even in her physics, friction is known as the essential evil. Nothing will move without it. Uh, although it is a resisting force, you need that resisting force to move forward. So we, get, we could have a symbol of the lightning here, the metal hitting, you know, where test your metal. The sparks fly where man is tested, where the rubber hits the road, you know, uh, etc. We have lots of sayings about this. So the force hammer there would represent your, because uh, this is just uh, something I want to bring up too, because people often put a lot of uh, power in, uh, say, the Volknot and uh, Woden. But people seem to be a bit more flippant about the Force Hammer. And the Force Hammer is your, in my opinion, would be your commitment to taking on the struggle, to fighting, finding out and seeking out all which would harm your folk and your land. Remember, the folk, uh, the folk and land. You are the orderer. You bring order to that. The hero protects that, protects its boundaries, sanctifies it. But you are by wearing the hammer, saying that you are seeking this out, seeking out adversity before it becomes a problem. And if it is a problem, it's your idea to deal with that. And this is where we get the idea of victory. People just want to simply use it as a victory, like the victory room, which is very similar to the force hammer. But you have to make that victory happen. You are the one that is, you, and you are committing yourself to it when you have it. So people shouldn't just wear it lightly. If there is a problem and you're around and you're wearing a false hammer, you are expected by the God that ordained it to step in. You're expected to step in to protect your folk at any time and land. You're expected if you wear the false hammer. Um, in my opinion, it's not a weak, weak symbol that just anybody can wear. And just a word of warning as well with the abandonment of four. Remember, I talked a little bit about industry there. When our people ban abandon for, abandon the, the God of, and abandon his symbol and replaced it with a cross, man went crazy. He, balance of nature, he no longer saw the need to protect his realm. Now we have polluted riverways and waterways, chopped down every forest without care for the, for the balance. Man went out of control. He lost his ordering figure. He lost his duty. He became unduty bound and selfish. He was convinced by Loki without Thor there to lead him back to the right way. So, although Thor does have to impose a little bit on nature, he must keep that balance, as I said. And they learned that very early on in the Neolithic, where we see that the erosion of topsoils and they very rapidly changed their, changed their ways to keep harmony with the land. I mean, look at the modern world now. No harmony. We're destroying it. And no good men are standing up. Well, very few good men are standing up to fight for it in the correct way. 
So in, in short, you know, we have the holy union, the sacred kingship, the protection of the land, land balance within the world. Now, just a little note here from actually Starkard. I'm going to quote Starkard, who was, uh, or Stark Arthur, who was actually a bane of Thor because um, he was giant related, but Thor can talk on that, 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 uh, on that one. But, uh, but uh, I want to do a quote from what Stark Arthur is supposed to have said. He's an ancient hero from the early Viking Age, early Middle Ages. But uh, he talks about uh, here a leader that has lost his way, a leader that does not embody for, has not took a leadership to sacred. And he says, he, he who covets his mean pittance fondly, soliciting a sluggish life, by handling entrusted commissions with venal tongue, he infringes laws by violence, assaults men's rights with the sword, tramples down innocence, feeds on debtors, loves greed and lechery, sneers with his biting laugh at fellowship and picks whores as a hoe weeds grass. Faint hearts perish though battlefields in peacetime are silent. Though he lies at the heart of a veil, no screen will protect one who fears fate. Eventual doom snatches everyone alive. There is no hole for evading death. Now, like I say, it's interesting because Stark Arthur is seen as uh, Thor supposedly dislikes Stark Arthur, but Stark Arthur almost represents and embodies Thor with his words there talking about sacred, uh, the sacredness of a leader and how he should protect his realms, not abuse them. Uh, and another instance here of where he uh, shows uh, his, his, his similarities to Thor, actually, is in his uh, choice of hardship. Uh, Stark Arthur would uh, walk everywhere, not walk, run, not take horse, horses. He would choose in every instance the harsh, harshest path uh, because he believes that that's the only way that men were ready for war or ready to defend themselves. Here's a little poem, he said. Valiant men eat raw rations, no need for sumptuous feast. I think for stout-hearted beasts that contemplate the trade of war, Fitter for you to sink your teeth in your bristly beard, bite and rend it, lavish cook shop, staying my hunger with rancid fare. Few took joys in days gone by to simmering sauces. Um, and for people wondering whether, uh, um, so th this is a. Uh, I just wanted to add that there because uh, Stark Arthur gets a bad, a bad deal with some of the mythologies that say that he's the antithesis of Thor when he's actually completely, completely in agreement with him. And he actually has a great respect for uh, authority. Um, like I say, he almost embodies Thor, interestingly. He could be a Thor, a Thor idea. Um, so... In finish, in short, I'll just sum it up in short now because uh, well, the Force Hammer is, as I say, uh, in my opinion, a symbol that you meet adversity, that you uphold law and order, and that is natural law and order. As we saw with Starkarder's quote, our lords can become uh, corrupt. That is not our interest. As the hero, we uphold the natural order. We uphold the sacred realms of men. We embody the hero. We protect our land and our folk. Our axe rises against the enemy, not our own. Uh, and we are bound, duty bound if you wear the hammer, to face that adversity wherever it shows. Cowardice would not be accepted. If you wear the hammer and, and shy away from uh, your duty, I would like to be in your boots when, uh, if you ever meet the mighty man for himself and what he might do to you. But let alone that, meet your own ancestors and your descendants as they come into the afterlife. And forever to walk as a coward. So that's it. 
Uh, that's my short summation of the Force Hammer. Um, and like I say, there's a lot more to this symbol, a lot more to this motif, this, this uh, sacred talisman. There's a lot more to four. This is just a presentation on a few bits, and it's already been a long time. So uh, I hope you learned something from it. Uh, and if not, I hope that it at least piques your intrigue. Anyway, guys, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I'll end it with uh, the chains that bind, um, as I think is kind of appropriate for this stream. All right, well, thanks for listening. And uh, thank you for the donations. I know we've got a few more over at DLive, and we really appreciate that. And I'll catch you next week. Bye for now. Man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. The chains that bind me, I do not curse or scorn. Instead, I adore. The chains that bind me, I take time to give attention and care. The chains that bind me are heavy, and I wish them to become heavier more. Inescapable, unrelenting, possessing, and decreed by natural law. They pull me and throw me. They move me and overwhelm me. They drag me and force my will. For the chains that bind me are not of iron rules, but blood, soil, and soul, and crafted by divine hands. See, man was born of love and attached, in one world cut but not the other. His bond, his freedom, the greater the number, the greater the life. For what is a man if not a bond himself? Without them, an empty vessel, unadorned.